Well... Today we'll restore the badly rusted power transformer assembly for the PEP 4032 in preparation for getting power to the main board. All right. I'll also update you on some other restoration steps that are in the works. This has become a really cool project for me. I mean, I guess you could call it a pet project. But the more I work on it, the more I'm just fascinated with this machine and the level of technology in it. And I just can't wait to get it working because this thing is so cool. If this video seems a little different, it's my first try after changing from Adobe Premiere Pro to DaVinci Resolve. And from what I've seen, even if the cost was the same, I think in the long run, DaVinci Resolve is going to be better than Premiere for what I'm doing. Let me know what you think. You wouldn't think that this power supply would take much to restore, but as I broke things down, I realized there's a lot to do. I want to do a high quality restoration, so it's going to need to be disassembled and have the rusty fasteners replaced, have all the rust removed, the frame and band are going to need painting, the IEC connector will have to be replaced because it has integrated reefa capacitors. Finally, it'll all have to go back together and get tested. To start out, I needed to get rid of all the grime because gross. Once I can handle it without feeling grody, I had to deal with the screw I came across last time with a stripped head. So what I ended up doing was to first remove the nuts from the base plate, then while holding the stripped head with the vice grips, I used a wrench on the hex-shaped standoff and bada bing bada boom, it was off. Man, this band is seriously rusty. We'll see what we can do about that in a bit, but first the switch, fuse holder, and IEC connector have to be removed from the frame. Once it was out, I carefully disassembled the IEC connector to examine the built-in reefa caps, and they were indeed primed for failure. I have a new one, complete with filter caps on hand, and I should be able to reuse the switch and fuse holder. Now that the frame and band are free, I sanded them with 120 grit sandpaper to remove the bulk of the rust, then again with 600 grit sandpaper to smooth the surface. They were then treated with Furtan Rust Converter as recommended by the friendly folks at the VCF forums. I'll put a link for both in the description below. Once the Furtan does its work, it leaves behind a paintable layer of zinc oxide, so the part just needs to be washed and it's ready for paint. However, this paintable layer is only present where there was rust, so I decided to go ahead and use a primer coat anyways. It was really cold out, so I had to heat up the garage. Then I primed and painted the parts with rattle can automotive paint. Once they were done, I was pretty happy with the results. I did decide to keep the original label, even though it was a bit crusty around the edges from rust. I don't feel it was bad enough to warrant a reproduction label. Now at this point, the app that I've used forever for shooting on my phone, Filmic Pro, decided to start corrupting all the data files. Then after an update trying to fix it, they wanted a monthly subscription fee on top of the lifetime purchase I had already paid. So sadly, some footage was lost. Thanks, Filmic! With the transformer remounted and a new video app on my phone, I reinstalled the fuse holder and then the switch. So next the IEC connector needs to go in, but I either need to install it upside down, which I am not a fan of, or the hot neutral leads are going to be a bit close to the frame. I decided to put crimp on spade connectors where I could, including on the IEC connector, so they'd be removable and well insulated. I also insulated the frame with a small piece of electrical tape just to be safe. I started by carefully bending out the solder tab on the fuse holder that had to be bent flush to remove and install the holder from the frame, and then it happened. The connection spade for the fuse holder broke off under the plastic, leaving nowhere to solder a wire. And then the fun began. I figured, no problem, I have fuse holders on hand, but I discovered that the shaft on them was too large to fit in the hole in the frame, and I did not want to have to drill it out if it could be helped. Next, I found some on Amazon that looked like they'd be a good fit, and I figured I'd order them since they'd only take a couple days to get here. Or so I thought. So they ended up getting shipped late, then the shipment was delayed, and then because the shipment was delayed, they got cut up in the Christmas blizzard back east. So they finally arrived a couple days after Christmas, and they do fit, however, it looks like they take 20 millimeter fuses instead of the standard 30 millimeter fuses that the PET uses. 
they'll work, but I'd rather have something more original. So while I was waiting for some 1.6 amp 20 millimeter fuses to come, I was cleaning and organizing some of the parts from the stone collection. And what do you know, I come across three fuse holders new in the bag. I opened one up and bazinga, they're a perfect fit. I'm guessing these are new old stock from the 80s that the school used for pets. And well, it just fits perfectly. So the question is, was I lucky that the next box I went through had the fuses in it? Or was I unlucky that they weren't in an earlier box? Who knows? Either way, I was then able to get everything back together. Once that was done, I realized I had left the two solder connections on the fuse holder bare, which will not do since they'll be carrying line voltage. But it was a simple matter to add a couple pieces of heat shrink tubing since I had added spade connectors to the wires for easy removal in the future. <laughs> wasn't much of a future, that was like five minutes. The next part where the big capacitor gets reformed was fascinating for me. I've never done this in the past and big capacitors like this tend to be fairly durable and a replacement's about $35. Yikes! I removed the cap for the harness for easier access and connected it to my bench power supply which I had set to one volt at a maximum of 100 milliamps. For this, a current limiting DC power supply is very useful. I'll link the one I used below. Now I haven't done this before, but my understanding of the reforming process is that the aluminum layer inside the capacitor needs to have an aluminum oxide coating on it to prevent leakage. The aluminum oxide layer is formed and reinforced by current flowing through the capacitor and it can crack over time when the capacitor is not used. If too much voltage without a current limit flows through this cracked layer, it can cause further damage to the cap. To reform the layer without damaging the cap, you need to start out with a low voltage with a limited current so the aluminum oxide layer can heal. Now remember that the current limit is enforced by the power supply, so we won't get a big surprise if there's a short circuit. So let's see how that went. We're going to go positive to positive, negative to negative. We are going to set the power supply to one volt and uh, 0.1 amps or 10 milliamps, 100 milliamps. Turn it on and you can see that it has zero current draw. So then I will increase the voltage to two volts. And we draw a little power and then it drops off. Three. It draws a little power. So what it's doing is initially it's drawing power to charge the capacitor. Then once the capacitor is charged, there's a leakage current going on if there is damage to the aluminum oxide layer. So my understanding is that that chemical reaction happens to rebuild the layer. And so as we increase this, we'll increase it slowly up to 15 volts. Uh, each time waiting for the current draw to drop to zero before going to the next step. And if we reach any steps where it will not go to zero uh, within about a minute or so, then that means that the uh, capacitor is probably beyond saving. And at least to say, this is a 15 volt rated cap. If we go above 15 volts, we risk bursting it. Now, this is the first time I've ever tried doing this. So if I'm doing anything wrong, I am sure somebody will be more than happy to let me know in the comments. So we finally reach a point of equilibrium. It's taken a while now each time. And I have seen uh, somebody do this using the existing transformer and the five volts. Um, that's certainly, I suppose, a possibility, but of the methods that I researched, this is the best I could come up with. Um, now, if you have a proper cap tester that can run uh, current for a long time, uh, my understanding is that's a lot uh, safer on the cap, easier on the cap, but uh, in my case, I do not have one, and this is all I can do. There we go, back to zero. And my understanding is, is that as that aluminum oxide layer is being built up, as we increase the voltage, we're increasing the uh, pressure for leakage to happen. And then 
as that current slowly trickles through, it rebuilds the aluminum oxide layer. So we're building that up. Clearly, I think if we just powered up this cap, we might have done damage to it by punching too much power through too quickly through those holes in the layer. So once I get it up to its rated voltage of 15 volts, I will leave it on for a couple of hours. That way it'll have time to really uh, reform and, and get into good shape. I don't think it was actually necessary to go one volt at a time. I find it interesting that such a huge cap uh, only has a 15 volt rating. It's kind of hilarious. But uh, this cap is 23,000 microfarads. So would that be 23 millifarads? Almost there. And unfortunately, I don't have anything that can measure the ESR on such a large capacitor, or I don't know how to do it. Obviously, my, uh, my meter is not powerful enough to charge this thing up. And there we have it. We are at zero current flow, 15 volts. So I'm going to give it a couple of hours, and uh, looks like this capacitor is in good shape, and we'll be ready to power things up soon. All right. I'm going to link a much more detailed video below from the Byte Attic that goes into detail on the cap reformation process. So I found that process fascinating, and I was really happy to see that things came out exactly the way I expected. To test a transformer, we'll first check across pins 9 and 11 that provide power to the 12-inch CRT, and we should get around 22 volts. Perfect. Then we check between pin 8 and pins 4 and 7. We should get about 9 volts on each. Oh, that looks great. Finally, between pins 6 and 8, we should get around 17 or 18 volts, and we should also get about the same between pins 4 and 6. All right, the transformer's looking great, so we should be able to apply power to the motherboard in a future video. I can't wait. I'm just dying to get to that. That thing is a beast. Speaking of the main board, I've gotten a ton of work done on it, which will be covered in that future video. Uh, this thing is looking so much better than it was, but I've got a lot of problems I'm going to have to deal with, like failure of the ground strap. <laughs> and visibly, it's starting to look great, but all of the socketed chips had rusted through pins, and there's a lot of ICs that are soldered onto the board that have rust crawling up the pins and into the housing of the chip, and that's just like cancer on these things. That is not a good sign. So I have a feeling I'll be replacing a lot of these. But I want to make one thing clear because the person who gave me this machine got a little bit of flack from a couple people for giving me such a trashed machine. And I'm pretty sure Sean did it in response to me telling him how much I love a challenge. And I do love a challenge. I am having a blast with this thing. Way more fun than I ever would have had if it had been in perfect working condition. So Sean... Thank you. This thing is beautiful and I'm loving it. So I've started restoration on the chassis and the VDU board. I've started working on more rust removal and more painting. This thing's going to be awesome when it's done. I can't wait. I really can't. Learning the capacitor reformation process was really exciting and I'm really glad to feel comfortable with it now because I have a number of machines that have been kind of on my back list because I wasn't sure how to deal with the big caps and the power supplies. I'll show you some of those in a future video. I want to do some exploration videos that tell you a little bit more about some of the stuff I have. Once I've got the main board done, I'll link the video right here. And in the meantime, here's the video where I first tore down this machine and took a look at it. Thanks for coming!